Okay, well, good afternoon. Welcome to exam two review for thermodynamics, uh, physics 123. Um, might as well get started. Uh, just starting off, basically, the idea of, of temperature and how we measure it. Of course, we all have intuitive notions of hot and cold. Uh, looking in hindsight, hopefully all of this looks very familiar to you. Uh, the idea that uh, we can use a, a pressure gauge, uh, really using the ideal gas law to force the pressure and have a direct relationship between uh, temperature and pressure. You did this in the lab, or most of us have done it in the lab, uh, is the idea that we can take a couple of set points, like ice and water is defined to be zero degrees Celsius, boiling water is defined to be 100 degrees uh, Celsius, uh, at atmospheric pressure, there's little fine points in there. We're going to kind of gloss over those. The idea that the pressure is then directly proportional to, or uh, something we will call the absolute temperature, but the idea that it's a linear relationship. In the lab, we had these points. We also went down a little bit with the dry ice. We didn't get all the way down to absolute zero. The idea of that would be that at absolute zero, uh, the pressure should drop to zero. And with the kinetic theory that we're going to develop, that means that uh, all molecular motion, at least classically, ceases. And uh, that's the lowest possible temperature. And uh, experiments, of course, and you did it in the lab, come up with that that was uh, at 273 below zero, that is in terms of Celsius. And that's something we call absolute temperature, and that's going to be the, the uh, Calvin. And I think you're all, hopefully <laughs> by now, you're all comfortable with that idea. Uh, kind of in practical terms, Fahrenheit gets used a lot, particularly in the weather. Uh, there is that relationship that ties together Celsius with Fahrenheit. At freezing, when uh, T Celsius is zero, Fahrenheit is at 32. And you can do the math uh, with this and come up with boiling water at 212. Uh, we're going to use primarily the uh, Celsius in the Calvin scale, but sometimes he hits a little extra bonus. It did you remember that formula? So you may want to look at that. Um, we're going to play here first with the idea of linear thermal expansion. Uh, the idea of a solid, you heat it up, it, it expands, it gets bigger. All linear dimensions of that will get bigger. Uh, including if we cut holes in something when we heat it up, the hole gets bigger as well as everything else gets bigger. This is something people have a little trouble with. You can maybe start with, if you're having trouble with that, picturing this hole is plugged in with some of this metal and surrounded by this kind of washer shaped thing. And if we heat it up, everything is going to expand, including that plug that's in the center is going to expand. And you can imagine we take it out and we still have a, now a bigger hole. Uh, so, g try to get comfortable with that. The idea that the change in length should be proportional to the difference in uh, change in temperature, it depends also on the original length, and then some property of the material, which is the th uh, linear thermal expansion constant, and it depends on the material, and he's going to give those on the exam. Uh, uh, unless he asks you to somehow calculate it and find it. But that's the basic idea where this thing uh, changes in length. Now, you want to keep in mind that uh, this is the change in length. Something that's probably more useful in most problems is you actually want the length of something. You start off with something plus some change in the length will give you the final length. Oh, a little note here, uh, keep things in terms of final minus initial. Uh, the idea is your signs will work out very nicely. If uh, t the final temperature is greater than the initial, meaning we're heating it up, it makes sense that it's going to get bigger. This uh, being larger than this, this whole thing will be positive, meaning it's going to increase in length. If we cool it down, we still use the same, same expression. T final now would be less than T initial if we're cooling it down. Then this minus sign would rule and we would get a negative here. So the signs will work out automatically as you stay uh, with this final minus initial. And we want to add that to the original length. So usually for practical problems, uh, we're going to be playing with this kind of relationship. Again, we add that 
and just do a little math and this is probably the form that is the most useful in problems. Uh, you remember you had a homework problem where you had like a brass ring and an aluminum rod and you heated up the brass ring, you slid it over and they come back and then you want to heat it up again. Well, what you want to do, if you want to be able to get, and then you try to separate the two, you want to figure out what you'd want to heat it up or cool it down to so you could get them off. You wanted their two diameters to be the same so that you could separate them. Not the change in diameter from one to the other. Uh, so, uh, anyway, uh, this, uh, let's, let's, do a, let's do a problem uh, in, in a second here. <laughs> There's one other issue. Sometimes we have volumes, which is real typical with liquids. They can take any kind of shape. Uh, but uh, we can talk about the volume expansion. Let's say I have a cube of material and it's got sides a, a, a sub i for initial. And of course, its volume is the cube of that. And if we're going to heat it up, we get a, some a final. All sides are all going to grow in all directions. And that would be v final. Um, so a final should be just the linear expansion plus uh, we're going to have that v final would be we'd want to cube that since uh, since we're dealing with a cube here we want to deal with a volume so when we cube that there's uh, well you math types I like to do this kind of stuff you've got this you're going to cube it and I'm going to do that and expand it uh, you shouldn't have to do all of this. Uh, but this relationship for an approximation is something we'll make use of. That I expect that this change in volume should be rather small, or change in length of the side should be small. Uh, we're going to end up with these terms, which are going to be squared and cubed. This is going to be very small. Since we start with something small, we square it, it gets smaller. We cube it, it gets extremely small. We're going to assume that those uh, are, are effectively zero, and we can get a volume uh, that is going to be proportional to just this part of it. And uh, this... Uh, is handy where we'll say three times alpha and replace that with a beta. This is going to be the volume expansion coefficient. And so if you're given, like in a problem, which we'll look at in a minute, uh, is something where we're dealing with a linear expansion along with a volumetric expansion, we can, we can set these, uh, the volume expansion coefficient equal to three times the linear coefficient. Hopefully you're comfortable with that idea now. Okay, let's put it, put it to a test. This is his uh, problem. And uh, let's just uh, take a look at this. 500 milliliters of molten lead at 650 degrees. So we start out hot. It's in thermal equilibrium, a copper cup. Assume the copper cup uh, is a hollow cylinder. You, you can read that. Uh, we're going to put a molten lead in this stuff. And uh, then we're going to uh, take it from 650, we're going to cool it down. Uh, as we cool it down, I expect the cup to shrink, and then also the lead inside to shrink. And so we've kind of got the before and then the after picture. Uh, uh, now when we fill up the lead inside this thing, we want to mark the container. So we maybe take and we etch or mark a line with the top of the lead. Uh, I'm going to measure the height up will be the, le the uh, height of the lead should be equal to the height of the mark. So I'm, I've got L uh, to be the, l the lead and H to be the height of the mark. And these are both going to change uh, so they're not going to line up anymore when we cool it down. Okay, uh, in fact, he's asking the question, how f far below the mark is the top of the molten lead when the system cools to 450? So he want, that's, that's the question. How much does this sit below? Uh, he gives you the linear expansion of the copper and also the linear expansion for the, for the molten lead. And the molten lead, of course, is like a liquid that can uh, take the shape of the container. Everything on this copper cup is, is we're going to shrink down in diameter. It starts out at three centimeters. It's going to shrink down to something. We have to determine what that is. Every dimension of the copper cup is going to come down. Uh, and then the lead will 
take that shape but will come up to only a certain uh, level of height. Now in doing these problems uh, one thing is wow 500 milliliters most of the things we're going to be dealing with should be in SI units and uh, uh, this is a real common one to give liquids in terms of liters 500 milliliters and so we want to come up with what is a liter and a liter is a cubic decimeter it's it's uh, the volume of a cube that would be 10 centimeters on a side so 10 times 10 times 10 is going to be a thousand cubic centimeters in a liter so hopefully kind of get a picture in your mind so you don't uh, you, you know don't make out something that's really crazy uh, 500 milliliters so each one of these cubic centimeters is a milliliter. This is a thousand cubic uh, milliliters or cubic centimeters. And so a 500 milliliter would be half of this is that's how much lead you would have. So one milliliter is a cubic centimeter. You want to be able to make that very useful in many problems. Okay, uh, so this 500 cubic centimeter or 500 milliliters is 500 cubic centimeters. I want to figure out how high it goes up in this cup. Originally at 3 centimeters in diameter, of course, take the 3 divided by 2. Pi r squared is the cross sectional area here times L1, which is going to be the height of the lead. That's how much 500 cubic centimeters should come up. And uh, so we can. Do, do a little math, quick math here, you can do that. That would be 70.74 centimeters would be the height of the lead, and that's also going to be the height of the mark, since we're going to mark it. Then, uh, uh, of course, that height of the mark when we cool it from 650 down to 450 is going to, uh, is going to shrink. And here's where I want to use my linear expansion for this. That uh, that height is going to be the original height. That's that times uh, one plus the alpha for the copper times the change in temperature. Final minus initial. So this is is negative. It's going to get smaller, and is going to come down. And uh, so, of course, we can do the math here and it comes down 70.5 so it's only dropped like a quarter of a centimeter from where it was okay so always be looking at these things and asking yourself if they're somewhat making sense uh, now not only is the length and the height of this thing is going to shrink but also the diameter is going to shrink and it's going to shrink proportionately the same. So uh, when I crunch these numbers, you don't have to keep doing this again and again. This constant, this is a fraction of the original length. That fraction is going to apply to any linear measurements we have, including the diameter of the cup. So I can just take that 0.9966, that's all the math here, and translate it into any of the dimensions, in this case the diameter, and it's going to go down in diameter a little bit. Okay, uh, now the final volume of the lead. Here's where we want to deal with the lead as, as a volume. Uh, the original volume, of course, was 500 cubic centimeters. The new volume is, we're going to play the same game with 1 plus alpha, or 3 alpha. This is the 3 to give us the beta times the uh, change in the temperature and uh, you do the math it's it's this is all straightforward stuff uh, you come up with that it's 491 so it's come down from 500 down to 491 and it's got to fit in the cup so uh, this uh, volume uh, is going to be uh, some height of this lead up here we can get that volume is going to be pi r squared diameter divided by 2 squared pi r squared times that length which we don't know yet but that should be equal to the volume of lead that we expect to have when we cool it and then we can solve for L2 the uh, length of the uh, lead it's come down here again from that original length down to L2 get that 
and uh, x, he's asking for how far does this sit below the mark. Uh, we can take the fact that we have h2, the height of the mark, and then also now the height of the lead, and we can take the difference of those two and come up with our answer. It's going to sit about a half a centimeter below that mark. Okay, does that make sense? Kind of going through this quickly, but uh, uh, this is relatively straightforward stuff, but you definitely have to keep your wits about you as far as doing the problems. thought this is a good representative one. Yeah? Uh, what was the pi uh, when I ran squared over two? <coughs> Oh, uh, this is, it's, it's pi r squared. Uh, be careful, these are diameters. <laughs> okay, so we want to take our diameter and cut it in half. And then squared. Yeah, so it's really pi r squared. So, yeah, lots of little places to mess up, as well as just simple algebraic mistakes that could be made. Okay, uh, this, this idea of heat, or... Uh, heat, uh, uh, what it was originally, they didn't really know much about it. It wasn't uh, really until Joule's work that we really started to understand heat. And that's really where the idea of conservation of energy really takes off, is, is really where Joule is working. As far as heat, it was kind of elusive. It had this idea that, well, clearly it flows. You get something hot next to something cold, and the heat flows to something that's hot. And uh, they thought of it very much like a fluid kind of model and you think you have a couple things you might if they're having fluids like uh, like water in here you have them at different heights they have different pressures here and if we're going to put them in contact you could imagine them connected here and the water from this one is going to flow into this one till they get the same level and this would be the analogous to temperature where they have uh, a lot of temperature it is high it is, it's high when a temperature comes down so one is coming down while the other one's coming up and so this is kind of this fluid model and of course we don't want to take it too seriously because it, it breaks down on other levels but it, it does have that basic idea that uh, temperature and energy are not exactly the same thing uh, the idea that they do reach the same uh, temperature, but the amount of the heat on this side, in this case, now we understand it as energy. This energy is not necessarily equal to the energy of this just because their temperatures are equal. So this helps a bit. Uh, this caloric, or this heat, was called a calorie, and we're still using it today. You use it a lot in chemistry. We're going to be using it probably more with the SI unit of energy in joules. But uh, it's good to keep in mind that the original definition that we continue to work with is this one calorie of heat, is the heat or heat energy required to raise one gram of water just one degree Celsius. Uh, if you want to think of a, a gram of water, uh, oh, by the way, a, a liter, uh, a liter of water is a kilogram. This is the original definition of a kilogram. So if you've got, uh, and this is, uh, it's in science, real precise science, this is uh, not very practical because it expands and contracts and there's different things in the water. Uh, but for the problems we're dealing with, it's a, it's a good one. So that if you've got a, a liter of water, it's a, it's a kilogram. And therefore, just one cubic centimeter of this would be a gram. And so if you kind of picture a cubic centimeter of water, one calorie would raise that just one degree. Um, so just trying to... Now, it was Joule that really got us thinking about uh, heat. And uh, this is, where, uh, again, where energy can come into play. And we're going to name our unit of energy in Joules in, in honor of this. The idea, he played all kinds of experimental games with this. He had weights where we could deal with mechanical energy, potential energy. As this comes down, these things would turn the paddle wheels. There'd be friction. This fluid, and he tried all kinds of different fluids, would uh, heat up and go up in temperature. And uh, he found that it had the same rise in temperature whether uh, you 
had uh, you did this quickly or whether you did it slowly. Uh, he even had uh, some where he had uh, masses tied to not pulleys, but to generators that would generate electricity. And that electricity would go in with heating coils and heat up the water, and it would rise to the same temperature. So this is really where we're getting to this idea of conservation of energy, no matter how we do it, whether we do it mechanically, electrically, or some other way, chemically, uh, in terms of, well, in any, any form of energy, we can tie that together. And this is where uh, the idea of energy, it took over a hundred years to really soak in. Now we're sort of so used to talking about it that, and it seems so intuitive to us, we don't see what their problem was. Um, but uh, anyway, we honor Kua Duo for this. Uh, and he made uh, the uh, conversion here. This one calorie uh, would be 4.186 joules uh, to accomplish the same thing. So you definitely want to know this relationship and you want to be able to work back and forth between these. Okay, um, let's deal with some calorimetry. This is uh, like we had done in the lab. Uh, where we would take, uh, you know, maybe heat up a metal sample, we'd stick it in a bath of water, they'd exchange heat, and uh, we'd figure out what the final temperature was. We had this idea of the specific heat. Uh, we would do that in comparison to water. Uh, we'd uh, use water again. Uh, the idea of specific heat of water would be one calorie per gram degree C, uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, the uh, specific heats uh, is going to be Q. It depends on the amount of stuff we have. Uh, the specific heat is some property of the material and then there's going to be some temperature difference. So if we want to get double the temperature difference we'd have to double the amount of heat that we go with that. Now, just as a practical concern, we've got a sign convention that we use that if heat is going to come into something, it should warm up. We're going to call that plus. If the heat is extracted from substan some substance, we'll call that minus. And this sign convention works very nicely with this as long as you go with the delta T as final minus initial, that's your change in temperature, uh, the signs will work out automatically and I'll show you the advantage of this in doing problems. But uh, the idea would be that if, if we're putting in heat into something, that is a plus Q, it's coming in, I expect the final to be greater than the initial and the final temperature uh, would be uh, greater than the initial temperature and the overall when we subtract these this is going to be a positive quantity. If I happen to extract heat out of this thing I expect it to cool down and I expect the final temperature to be less than the initial temperature. If that's the case, uh, this is less than this, this minus sign is going to prevail and we're going to end up with a negative Q. So when you're employing this, I would say, unlike the book where they just says heat gain is equal to heat loss, uh, things get more complicated when you get three or more things going on. Uh, but to stay with this idea of the specific heat and stay with this T final minus T initial, like you would in a, in a math class, you'll be okay. And do expect these can either be plus again if heat's going in, minus if heat's coming out. Um, if we're going to have heat exchanges between things, like we did in the lab where we had the uh, sample goes into the water and the cup and we have some exchanges of heat, when we add up all of those heats, and we'll get to fusion and vaporization, they're going to follow along, we just add them up for a closed system, they should be equal to what? Yeah, going to be zero. Some are going to be plus, some are going to be minus, and the idea is that they're all separated and insulated away from the rest of the universe, they should just exchange heat back and forth between them, and overall it should be zero. And so this is the kind of the best way of laying out problems. And again, with specific heats, don't try to second guess whether they're going to gain heat or lose heat. Just always go T final minus T initial, and your signs will work out fine. Uh, when you get to latent heats of fusion and vaporization, let's say we have, let's say we have ice at zero degrees, we're going to add water. 
I mean, excuse me, we're going to add heat. That's going to start to melt that ice. Uh, however, does the temperature change in that process? No, it stays the same. It stays at zero. So you can have zero degrees ice, you can have zero degrees water, and if you've got a mix of the two, uh, they're going to they're going to be at zero degrees. Uh, same thing happens when we uh, well when we get it into the water state, we can add heat and the temperature will rise till it gets up to the boiling point where it's going to start to boil. And as we add more heat, we boil and boil more of that uh, water away, uh, but the temperature would stay at 100 degrees uh, for that boiling water uh, and uh, un until we boil it off and then we can get the energy and the temperature to rise again. So these type of problems can get to be kind of messy. You can often deal with, you know, you deal with ice, uh, you know, maybe a 30 below, you have to heat it up to zero. Then you go from zero to melt the ice, just the, and that's what we call the latent heat of fusion. There's no temperature change, so there's no delta T here. Uh, you do need to stop and think when you're doing these, uh, whether it's a plus or a minus, and think in terms of the sign of that thing is from this convention. If I'm adding heat, it's positive. If I'm taking heat away, it's negative. Uh, but we do need to stop with that. So we can include this heat of fusion, which is either uh, melting ice, it will be positive. If we're freezing water, it would be, we'd have to take heat away, it would be negative. And vaporization, again, that's turning uh, the water, hot water, into steam. We have to add heat for that. If we want to condense steam, we would have to take it away. So you need to stop and think about your signs there. Okay, let's uh, do an example. Uh, this is a uh, first problem. <clears throat> on the practice problem. Uh, we've got 25 grams of ice at zero degrees are added to a 12 ounce 355 gram soda. Okay, consider that the soda is really water. Okay, at uh, room temperature 22 degrees. And he wants to know what is the equilibrium temperature of the system? Okay, now there's lots of ways of doing this kind of problem. Um, um, the way I like to do it is to what I call my, my guess technique. Uh, if I, I'm just going to make an assumption, I just say take a look at this, and, and I'm thinking just kind of intuitively, I think I'm going to melt all my ice. And if I melt all my ice, something about this assumption though requires that that final temperature has to be between 0 and 100. Uh, if it turned out to be uh, negative or even greater than 100, we probably have really done the math wrong, but uh, then, then I would have to question my assumption. Since there's only really one solution, if I can find a solution that satisfies, I've got it done and I can quit work. Uh, so what we'll do, I'm going to just take, uh, adding up all my cues, I'm going to need to add some heat. So I need to stop and think about this sign. I'm going to add some heat. I've got a mass of 25 grams. Uh, he gave us in the problem, let's see, the latent heat of fusion of H2O is 80 calories per gram. Uh, so I'm going to, <coughs> excuse me. So I'm going to, this will melt all of that ice. Then I'm going to take that ice, which is at zero degrees, and, it, and I'm going to lift, raise it to some final temperature. That's what I want to find. Uh, the, use the specific heat of water, one calorie per gram degree Celsius. And I, again, I don't know T final, but I do know that it starts at an initial of zero. So this is kind of the ice water, you could say. And then we have the warmer soda, the 355 grams of that. It too is water, same specific heat, T final, but its initial temperature is, is at a minus 22, excuse me, is at 22 degrees Celsius. The minus is T final, minus T initial. Uh, so then it's just a matter of doing the math. Okay, I do the math, solve for T final, and I get a 15.3 degrees Celsius. Wow, how does that square with my assumption? Okay, I, I got lucky. 
I, uh, it's, it's between the two. Uh, so I have a solution that, that sa fills the bill. I don't need to keep looking. I, I'm done. I've got the problem and I realize it's 15.3. Now, just to kind of illustrate this, uh, it helps with this next part of the thing. Uh, oh, by the way, this I'm going to cross this off. It really doesn't belong there. Uh, VRMS, uh, I'll talk about this later, but this is really for a gas and these are liquids. So it's like, I don't know why this was put here. Um, this part of the problem, though, contrasts very nicely with this one. It says, okay, now we're going to use, instead of 25 grams of ice, we'll use 100 grams of ice instead of that. What would be the equilibrium temperature of the system? Okay, so I think, well, I was pretty lucky with that one. Maybe I'll just try it again here for this part. And let me just make that same assumption. I'm going to melt it all. And, uh, of course, that requires that if I do that, that final temperature had better be between 0 and 100. And uh, so I go ahead and just like this one, I stick in. Basically, I'm just sticking in 100 instead of the 25. Uh, everything else is the same. Uh, and I go looking for T final. And I solve for that. And I get a, whew, whew, almost negative 0 0.14 uh, Celsius. So what about my gas? Yeah, it's a bad gas. So it's not between 0 and 100. So now I conclude that, wow, I must not have melted all the ice. I don't want to conclude, oh, it's at a minus 0.4. Okay, that would be a sucker answer. What is the final? It's got to be zero. You've got a mixed state. And so this, is, this, this would be my conclusion. Uh, P final has got to be zero. Now, he doesn't ask any more in this problem, but a, not, a common follow-up is, well, if you didn't melt all your ice, how much ice have you got left in there? Uh, so then you can turn this around, and basically, instead of sticking in 100 grams, that was my assumption, I was going to melt all of that, I'm going to melt a certain mass of ice, and I'll just put in M for that, since I don't know what it is. I'd have to put it in here, but of course this is kind of redundant here, that I've got 0 minus 0, this thing's going to go away anyway. And uh, I've got the, the soda, I do know that it would go from 22 down to this final temperature of 0, so I've got that. So then I can solve for the mass of the ice that, and this is the acid mass of the ice that melts, okay, he might ask for the ice that's still remaining. This is what actually went through the phase transition. Uh, so almost all 100 uh, went that way. But, so anyway, this is kind of, again, this is sort of my guess technique. If you've got other ways of doing it, you've been doing it in chemistry, some, some things kind of do like a running total as you go through the process. That all makes sense. That's good. Um, how, whatever works for you, uh, go for it. Uh, good chance you're going to get something like that. Okay, uh, the second question in the reviews is, oh, what is the change in entropy of the universe? Wow, so pretty lofty here. Uh, in problem one, when 25 grams of ice was added to the soda. Um, I was going to wait till later. I'm going to have a lot to say about, uh, uh, a lot more to say about entropy than what we have here. But I thought this might be a good time just to kind of throw it in here since it's a direct extension of problem number one. And in fact, in order to do this problem, we would need to do problem number one, which we just did. So let's kind of look at that. Entropy. Okay, this is its definition. And uh, let's not, at this point, not get into the uh, deep questions of what, just what is entropy. Hope to talk a little bit about that. And I'm not sure I've got the definitive answer on that. But using this, the three bars just mean it's a definition, so we can just go ahead and apply the definition and do it. And this is typical of a problem you're going to see with entropy, uh, so uh, it's, it's a good one to just kind of get down. He's not going to get really tricky with entropy problems. This, uh, again, would be a typical example. Uh, now we have a number of things uh, exchanging heat. Each uh, exchange of heat has an a Q associated with it and some temperature that that, that happens. Oh, by the way, this temperature must be in Kelvin. 
in order for this to work. Uh, so we're going to start with this first thing where we take the ice at zero degrees and we're going to melt it uh, just to water at zero degrees. It's not going to undergo a change in temperature. It's going to stay at 273K during this entire process. Uh, so we need to uh, just put in what I what I have here I've got 25 grams of water this is just really out of part part one 80 80 kilo, uh, calories per per gram uh, the temperature 273 and of course we can just go ahead and calculate that this is going to be uh, 7.33 calories per gram this per would be the Calvin. Oh, per Calvin thank you yeah well yeah watch me uh, on this uh, Okay, and this is, uh, uh, again, the change in entropy for that first part. Uh, now, we also have uh, the idea that we're going to take that ice water. In part one, we actually warmed it, and we needed to figure out what that was. So back in problem one, we came up with that this was going to go from zero to 15.3. So it's changing temperature. Now here's going to be a problem with this in that when we're changing temperature, uh, what do I do with the change in temperature here? That, there's going to be heat coming out, but the temperature is changing uh, very, uh, linearly from uh, 0 to 15.3. Uh, so what we want in any problem where there's a non-constant T, as in this case we're using specific heat, Q is equal to MC delta T, uh, is to do this problem and do it in differential form. So we're going to have a little tiny bit of heat happening at some change in temperature, but this would be happening, since it's a small exchange, virtually at the same temperature for that little bit of an exchange, and that's going to lead to a little bit of a change in the entropy. So we're playing, again, rather than Q over T, we're going to be Q, having that Q is going to be a little DQ over the temperature that we have, and that will be giving us a little differential amount of dS. Now what we need to do is add those up through, uh, uh, for the whole process, and so when I do that, I need to d add them up. We add them up with an integral. So the delta S is equal to the integral of dS. And that's going to be related to the integral relating to the temperature. And I've got 25 grams. Ooh, and I had this specific heat. I have one calorie per gram. Usually we have it in Celsius. I just slipped in the K there instead of Celsius. Yeah, ultimately, I want it to be in Kelvin. Yeah. How can I get away with that? Does it change and they have the same spatial distance? Yeah, yeah. Even though you know, the, the, the uh, Kelvin and the Celsius are different, a degree Celsius and a degree Kelvin, the change, and keep in mind that it was ultimately with specific heats, it's the change in temperature. So it changes the same amount whether it's in Celsius or Kelvin. So uh, I can just slip it in there and my units will work out well. Uh, my energies could be in either calories or joules, that's okay, but the temperatures have to be in Kelvin. And so, uh, uh, again, now when I, the grams cancel, I'm going to have the delta T, but I'm going to have it in calories per Kelvin. Uh, uh, I'm going to have a dT over a T. That screams for the logarithm. And then my limits here are 288 and 273. Uh, they, too, have to be in K, even though the, the Ks cancel. It's just the ratio of those that has to be the ratio of the Kelvin temperature. And then we end up with a change in the entropy. Again, it's positive, uh, 1.34 calories per, per Kelvin. And so I needed for my units to work out. So hopefully you're not bugged by that too much. Um, yeah? Why is it 80 calories per gram on the first part and then the second part is 1 calorie per gram? Oh, this is actually, well, we use 80 up here on this first part. That takes the ice solid to water. Now it is just, you might say, cold water, zero 
up to 15. So it is still water though, so I'm still using that. Yeah, so good good point. Yeah. How did you know that for the first part, uh, ice to water, you had to use the latent heat, but then for the second half where you turn the ice water to warm water, you had to use the specific heat? Okay, uh, now that parallels the, the first problem again. When we, we did those, we did those all as separate steps. Um, let me let me back it up just so we don't yeah what we're playing with was uh, really this where first we uh, do this we melt our our ice then we have ice water that we're going to take that 25 grams of ice water and heat it up okay so each of these represents a step I'm gonna have a delta s associated with this I'm gonna have a delta s associated with this and also a delta s associated with that so I'm very much using this when I get to this next problem and again the ice water that is uh, just in 80 calories per gram uh, now ice water and uh, then we go to the warm soda which is going to parallel what we just did uh, for uh, for the ice water and uh, that's going to be that 355 times in this is again one calorie per gram and I'm changing that Celsius just to K and then D and but this is to, uh, going through uh, a drop in temperature initial to final uh, that initial to final is going to end up giving us a negative we're going to be dropping entropy so it's going to be decreasing for the soda becoming in a sense more ordered and then for the total entropy we add up these entropies one two and three we add them up and they should in any spontaneous reaction they should be add up to something positive delta s of the universe is going to increase uh, with that change uh, some uh, some things increase uh, this water actually went down in entropy so it is possible to get to a more ordered state when you cool it down and uh, that would be the answer to the problem okay I'll come back I'm going to come back to entropy uh, and we'll come back to a problem very similar to this too when we get into gases but the same uh, change in entropy of the entire system with 100 grams of ice as well uh, yeah, you, yes, you could, he could have asked that. Uh, you would have this, uh, you wouldn't have this term since... Uh, would you get a negative change in this? I, I do expect that this final one still will be negative. You're going to take heat out of something. If you just think in terms of this, you can pretty well guess whether it's going to be plus or minus. Uh, this has got to be s some positive quantity. Uh, the Q could be positive if we're, if we're putting heat into it and that's in this case I could guess well that that's positive if I'm taking heat out like I was with the warm soda that would be negative so you should be able to kind of just intuitively look at that idea and guess what's going to happen okay whew, lot, lots of little topics here and particularly this first chapter and I'm hoping to breeze by them so we can get to the more difficult issues uh, thermal conductivity the idea that you can have something hot and heat is going to flow to something that's cold uh, the uh, we're just going to uh, play with uh, this relationship I think it's fairly reasonable the rate the heat is flowing is going to be proportional to and this is a called the thermal conductivity it depends on the material uh, it's going to be proportional to the cross-sectional area so if we've got let's say kind of like a, 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 a cylinder of metal here and and heat is flowing through it it has some cross-sectional area the, the, this heat is coming in the bigger that area the more heat's going to flow uh, it's going to depend on the difference in the temperature between these two things and then inversely to the length uh, between these uh, these things the longer this is the the more we're going to slow the uh, heat flow so it should make some sense um, be a little careful uh, this is T hot minus T cold sometimes we want to go and I've been stressing this idea of final minus initial well the heat's flowing this way and this is uh, lower than this and so uh, which is final and which is initial I guess if we're starting the heat this way uh, this is 
this is initial and this is final and they should be reversed now gets to be clumsy the book uses some absolute values uh, it's it's just a clumsy issue basically you want maybe the absolute value of the difference in temperature and the direction of heat flow is always going to be from hot to cold and maybe let your I, I would say let your intuition guide you better how to do than this than rather try to adopt some formalism um, okay uh, the book also goes into the insulating R value you know if you're buying insulation this is important to you or building a house uh, I'm gonna stay, steer clear of it it just has to do with your insulated qualities I, I regret that I even put it on there um, something that would be more typical of what he might give you on an, on an exam I'll give you a couple examples here uh, if we have you know a couple of temperature difference and we've got two metals like uh, gold and silver and uh, in this case we're just making them the same length we wouldn't have to do all of this but we could uh, ask for what the question the question might be well what is the temperature at this border between these two now if this was the same material you might say well it's going to be, be directly halfway between these two values since it's linear and this would be like at 55 degrees uh, halfway between 30 and 80 um, we're gonna play with the idea of heat flow now we can do this for the heat flow for each side for the for the uh, gold uh, it's got its thermal conductivity and I, I looked it up in the book and I'll provide that and certainly he would provide that it's got some kind of cross-sectional area I'm not sure what it is uh, some length to this thing I'm not sure what it is so there's going to be a heat flow there and then there's also on this side with the silver there's going to be some heat flow from here to here now we always want to go the hot minus the cold and oh I got something else to to make a comment about when we're doing problems like this we're assuming that we're in what we call a dynamic equilibrium when we first connect this so we just slid this thing from room temperature stuff into here it's going to take a while for the heat to penetrate and go on through here and so we uh, there wouldn't be any temperature change on this side until the heat started getting to it we're going to be playing with the idea that the heat has flowed and is going to continue to flow continually and has been doing so for however long it took to get into this state of dynamic equilibrium then we have whatever heat's flowing in here is going to be the same heat that flows through here that's going to flow out here and so that these two dqs should be the same so that when i uh, so this is this idea of dynamic heat, heat equilibrium that those have to be the same uh, so I can take and set these two things equal of course I'm looking for that temperature between the two so that's a, got it in red there so we keep our eye on it and uh, again now it's really just sticking in the numbers to solve for T and I come up with 51 point two degrees so it's not at 55 it's different because of the two different substances so these are pretty much plug and chug but you do want to understand these basic concepts and this idea of dynamic equilibrium isn't immediately apparent when you're doing these okay another type problem that is very similar to this would be let's say you've got a hot water pipe that's going and we've got maybe uh, some insulation wrapped around it and we're going to get some thermal conductivity from that so we've got some hot thing in here and some cold on the outside and then that heat would be radiating outward so in this case it's radiating out now you want to think in terms of this let me see if I got that okay this is our basic equation that we're working with the idea that think of this cylinder as being made up of a bunch of cylindrical sheets that we're going to unwind that heat is flowing through this and the flowing through it radially out through this border and it's got some length and so this this heat that's going to be flowing through this layer and we're just do a whole bunch of layers of this stuff on top of one another and uh, in that in that form we'll we'll take this as our basic idea 
Now, the area that this goes through is not the cross-sectional area this way. Again, the heat's flowing out and is perpendicular to the area. In this case, it's going to be that area is going to be 2 pi r, the, the circumference of this thing times the overall length of it. That would be the area. The length as from this equation would be the length of this thing. Well, this is going to be just a real small slice of this thing and it's coming through and it's got just a little tiny thickness which is going to be the effective length and that's going to be a dr. So hopefully you can make this transition from the standard form into this differential form and then this heat that's going through there we will have the idea of a of a of a dynamic equilibrium that's going to flow through all of this. So this is going to be really become some constant for the problem, although we'll come back and look for that. But I can arrange that and do a separation of variables. I've got the 2 pi, the 2 pi r that comes out over to this side of the equation. I'm also going to drop a dr, bring that over to up and over to this side. So I have a dr over this 2 pi and r. So this is looking like a natural log. Uh, this is the rate the heat's flowing. This is really a constant for our case. And then some change in temperature. So now the idea that this dynamic equilibrium, the heat is flowing from one layer to the next layer to the next layer as it goes out, we would integrate that uh, from a radius of from A out to B, the different radii of those layers, and uh, integrate this from the temperature at A and the temperature at B. And uh, again, obviously this dr over r is going to become the natural log with these limits. We've got that here. And then we can actually solve then for this constant constant heat flow that's flowing through this pipe is coming out the other end. And so uh, that's what that's going to look like. So uh, a lot of these types of problems are kind of these two types that I just kind of gave you an example of. And uh, hopefully you want to look, look them over. It's no telling what he's going to ask on the exam. Uh, there's a lot of material, right? Okay, now heat, we've been dealing primarily with this idea of conduction. That's most of the problems we'll be dealing with in terms of, of trying to solve this. Uh, there's other ways of heat. There's convection. Convection, you know, hot air rises, cold air settles. These things are very difficult to mathematically model, so I would say it safely, unless it's some trivial question, it's uh, going to be off the exam. Uh, also, radiation is going to be real important to us later. The idea that anything with any temperature at all is radiating or uh, some power, some energy flowing out of this thing, uh, is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. This relates back to this lab we did this last week. Uh, I don't think he's going to get heavy into this. We're going to actually return to this uh, in the last section when we get into modern physics. Max Planck, trying to understand what's going on here, uh, is going to lead to some real surprising results. It's going to really revolutionize physics. Uh, the idea that anything with any temperature uh, uh, is going to be radiating energy and this filament of this light bulb if you could match that color with this fire here we could say that if their colors match their temperatures are going to be the same um, okay beyond that I, th I think I'm just going to drop that just be aware of it uh, again unless he hits you with some question where he's just a plug and chug type that just expects well did they know the equation or didn't they Do you think we'll have to know the constant omega? Um, I don't know. I'm sure he'd tell you. Yeah, yeah it's sigma. This is Stefan's constant. Uh, he would, that would be part of the problem. Okay. Yeah, other things in here are, is going to be the area of that thing. Uh, bigger the area, the more radiated. Uh, the emissivity depends on the surface of the material. We played in the lab with, you know, white cans, silver cans, uh, black cans. Um, so anyway, again, more on this definitely later. Uh, so we're going to uh, move into the idea of the ideal gas law 
and we'll play with kinetic theory. How are we doing? Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so some of some of the things we're going to need to do. A lot of you know this stuff from chemistry, uh, but there's a number of people that haven't had any chemistry, so this is stuff you just got to know. Um, Avogadro's number, uh, this is just a certain number of, uh, kind of an arbitrary number, really. Um, ties in with, with chemists, so it's not, uh, uh, not going to get into the history, but it represents a real large number, and it's a way of, of counting things. So the, a mole, one mole of things has got this many atoms. I think I've got that. And so you want to think of a mole of sub, sub, substance as this many. It's huge number, 10 to the 23rd. Uh, you, you want to be able to, you, you know this one. Now here's where some of the concepts are going to be important. Uh, even if you know this stuff from chemistry is to, is to understand these ideas. Um, if we want to get the total number of atoms or molecules, uh, the, the notation here is going to be important. This is going to be some huge number. We'll give it a capital N to signify that it's huge. Uh, if we take the number of moles times Avogadro's number, so that should be the number of moles times Avogadro numbers, which is how many atoms or molecules per mole, that should tell us the number Small n is the number of moles. So typically in problems, small n represents some relatively small number. You have one, two, or three moles. Uh, whereas big N, this is huge number of uh, molecules. But this would conceptually tie the two together. And it's important that you be able to keep these concepts straight. So again, big N is the total number, huge number. That's why it's capital. A small n is this number of moles, which is more reasonable. Uh, if we deal with the mass of, uh, of a sample of, of gas, we could say, well, if I've got the mass of a single atom or molecule, and consider that m, these, the mass of a single atom, is going to be really tiny, right? A small, call that a small m. And if we, but if we take the the total number of these things times that, that should be the mass of the sample that we have. Uh, more practically, uh, we'll be doing this, that we take the number of moles of something times something we'll call the molar mass, or it gets called the molecular weight. Or I see up in the chat, anything up there, they call it the atomic weight. Uh, this idea of a weight is, you know, these chemists don't know, quite have this right here. This isn't like an mg. Uh, this is a mass, so it's uh, it is inertial. It's not uh, it's not mg, although it gets called a weight. And anyway, uh, molar mass is probably the most descriptive for our purposes in that it's how many, and it, it will be in uh, just historically, it's done in grams per mole. Chemists mostly playing with this stuff. You're not dealing with big, massive quantities of this stuff, so it's just convenient to keep things in grams. These are things you just have to watch for when you're doing problems to make sure you don't mess up. Uh, so, uh, again, molar mass would be Avogadro's number of these things. So it's, it's going to be a big, a relatively big mass, whereas small m represents the, uh, a, the actual mass of a single little atom. So big N times small m is equal to small n times big M. Trying to keep this stuff straight. And, but these conversions are going to be very useful in doing problems. Uh, okay, we'll be playing with the gas law and you've, I'm sure, been doing a lot with this already and if you've done it in chemistry, you've, you've done a lot with it already. Um, Ideal gas law. Uh, uh, it's based on experiment, a uh, number of different experiments, different values, parameters. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into the whole history with this. Uh, you've been working with it. Uh, mostly, what we're really playing with will be a little different than you've maybe had it in chemistry. We're going to be mostly playing with SI units. Uh, Whatever units you have, the temperature must be and must be in Kelvin. Okay, absolute temperature, so the pressures are directly proportional to that temperature. Pressures must be in Pascal. Uh, so a Pascal, one PA, is, is one Newton per square meter. 
Again, this is an SI unit. Uh, the volume uh, must be in, in cubic meters. Uh, when, uh, that is, if we're going to follow SI units. And if in doubt, make sure you're always dealing in SI units. Now, there's times you can get away with not having to do that, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. But if in doubt, go with the SI units the whole way. Um, this gas constant is, uh, is the gas constant per mole, since we have the number of moles times that. And uh, you want to remember this. This is the SI unit for the gas constant, 8.314, com comes out of experiment. Uh, that, uh, that is what we'll be using and playing with. You want to remember that. Uh, if you forget it on the exam, you go up and ask him, he probably would tell you, but give you a dirty look or something if you <laughs> think. Okay. Now, something that is also true, uh, the idea I was talking about that uh, small n versus big N, uh, there's uh, this gas constant per mole degree Celsius, the SI unit. This is actually SI also, but it's related to not the gas constant per mole, but this is the gas constant per atom. And this is something we call uh, K sub B, or Boltzmann's constant. Uh, and these two quantities are really interchangeable. You can say it's NR, that is the number of moles times the gas constant per mole, or capital N, which times the gas constant per molecule. And uh, you can exchange these, and this exchanging of this is going to come in handy for us. Again, Boltzmann's constant, case of B, gas constant per molecule. If you, I, uh, if you need to come up with a number for this, uh, go back to the idea that uh, if I take just uh, one mole, and Ava, that would represent Avogadro's number. I can solve for KB, in case you forget it, or I, I don't store it in my memory. I know how to get it real quick. I remember this one, and then if I need this one, I can get it by dividing by Avogadro's number. Lots of, lots of little things to remember. Uh, how about if you're using other units? Like in chemistry, typically you use liters. Okay, I talked about this a little bit ago. Uh, the idea of a liter being a cubic decimeter, uh, that's, uh, that's going to be a, a liter. Uh, so uh, consider that a liter, one of these, is there's going to be a thousand of these in a cubic meter. You got 10 times 10 times 10 is going to be a thousand in a cubic, cubic meter. So, be able to go back and forth between cubic meters and liters or milliliters. Um, and then, of course, one milliliter is one cubic centimeter. I already used that earlier. Uh, pressures, other units. Uh, pressure is force over area. The SI unit is Pascal, uh, which we talked about. Another common one is the atmospheric pressure. This is usually used with with chemists in that most of the things they're doing are taking place at atmospheric pressure. Um, uh, that, and this was also introduced to you in, in the end of Physics 121, so hopefully you kind of remember this from back then and there's less stuff you have to cram in your mind now. Um, one thing that's real handy with this gas law is sometimes you do have a mix of units and Something that's handy with the gas law, we can divide through by this. And uh, so PV, instead of PV equals NRT, I'll go PV over T is equal to NR. And for a given case, we usually have a fixed number of moles, whatever it is. This is going to be some constant. So this is a handy way to kind of write the gas law in a little different form that's very useful. And that is, uh, since these are equal, I can set initial conditions equal to final. I can say P1, V1 initial over T1 is equal to P2, uh, P final over V final over T final. Uh, the units we have to have regardless of how you use it is these have to be in Kelvin or absolute temperature. And the pressures though in volumes, if you have things like pressures in atmospheres, you can go ahead and 
put atmospheric pressure here uh, then your other final pressure would also be in atmospheric so as long as these are in the same units you're okay volume also if it's in cubic meters great if not if it's in liters you could keep it in liters and say this is so many liters and this is so many liters uh, these would would match whatever units you're using so you can kind of mix and match units uh, with this form for was your question or oh no okay uh, this is going to be a very useful form of the ideal gas law I'll be using this a lot uh, as we get a little bit into kinetic theory Whew, which brings us probably the meatiest topic here kinetic theory I think we'll go through this and then maybe we can take a break uh, this is sort of the heavy-duty part of uh, the class kinetic theory but I hope to, uh, when you look at this, I hope uh, you can kind of make sense of what's going on with this. Uh, the idea that, you know, we have a gas, and there's some kind of pressure behind it, it depends on the temperature. Uh, what is that idea of pressure? And the idea of kinetic theory is that there's these little things called molecules and atoms that are whizzing about. We're talking strictly about the gas state. And uh, for simplicity, we're going to put, let's say, a single atom uh, or molecule in it, let's say single molecule that's inside here and it's going to be banging around and ricocheting off of the walls it's going to have elastic collisions with the walls and uh, is going to build this idea of what we call a pressure uh, so if I have this this atom coming in uh, or molecule coming in it's going to strike the wall and bounce off with an elastic collision uh, this will generate what we'll call an impulse and this impulse on the molecule will be back in this direction just to kind of a reminder this is back in 121 when we first developed this stuff for impulse impulse was equal to the area under the force curve remember integrating FDT you might say well why do we care about that uh, but the derivation is really quite simple uh, F equals MA so uh, if I replace F with MA A is dV dt the dt's cancel and end up with just m dV uh, that integrates to mv final minus mv initial that's the change in the momentum so the idea of an impulse is going to lead directly to a change in momentum that's really what's happening here this molecule is coming in it's going to strike there's a change in the momentum it was headed this way it's going out this way uh, what about that change now uh, I'm dealing with I'm just going to look strictly at this face of this on this cube it's uh, there's, there's going to be collisions with the other sides of the cube as well but I'm looking primarily at this way we're calling this the X axis and so this is the X direction and initially this has a velocity coming in and it would have with an elastic collision an equal in magnitude but opposite direction uh, velocity going out uh, also uh, the direction in the Y it would be down here and it's going to be down here there's no change in the momentum in the Y there will only be a change in the momentum of the X and so this impulse I'm getting kind of sloppy but I think you can see that that impulse is going to be uh, back along in the negative X direction that's the impulse on the molecule uh, when it strikes there's action and reaction Newton's third law that the impulse on the molecule is this way but the impulse on the wall is in this direction that's that idea of the pressure where it's going to hit and uh, is going to be pushing on the wall from there this molecule after it collides here it's going to ricochet around this thing and it's going to strike again bounce off and come back and strike again and and continue doing this so we're going to have this single molecule banging around inside creating the the effective pressure of that single molecule or gas now the idea that these impulses there's going to be a bunch of them and they're going to come uh, repeatedly the faster this thing is coming the more often that they're going to repeat each one of those is going to provide an impulse which is going to change the momentum um, 
So, and that impulse is the area under the curve. So I've got that impulse all in red here. Um, now, the idea with the gas, though, uh, even though this, we're getting these pulses, you think, well, this isn't, this isn't a constant pressure. This is constantly being bombarded. Uh, we're going to come up with what's called the average force by smoothing this out. Uh, the idea that I could take this top part of the impulse and sort of fill this all in so that that impulse uh, oh, wait a second, I want to so that that impulse is going to be uh, the average force times this whole time. So average force times that whole time would be the area under here. We want that to match the, uh, the impulse that we have. And uh, that impulse should be the change in momentum. Uh, the momentum is, is final, which is in the negative direction, minus the initial, which was in the positive direction. You've done this kind of problem, I think, in, in Physics 121. We had a hailstone problem in there. And uh, you've got some problems here as well. That you kind of play this, this game out. Uh, this, and so we can get at the average force of these molecules striking uh, times the delta T, that's the time between them, and that should be equal to this impulse on this single molecule. Whew. Okay, this, I hope this makes some sense. You have to kind of think about it a little bit. Now, uh, it happens uh, every, every delta T. Now, you think about this thing. It's, the faster that it's moving, it's going to come back. And uh, looking at just the X motion, it's got a velocity in the x direction. That velocity times, let's say, half the time it takes to get back, it's going to go out to one wall, and the rest of the delta t is going to come back. So delta t is the time it takes to go out and come back and hit the wall again. Uh, that delta, it's just distance is velocity times time, or the delta t is, uh, I'm going to take that delta t and divide here, uh, I've got uh, 2d divided by v sub x. We can bring that v sub x up here. Okay, so we end up with an m v sub x squared. Okay, and come up with the average force. Uh, now this is, uh, this is the average force on the molecule, which is in the negative direction. The average force on the wall is back in this direction. Again, that's Newton's third law. So this is the average force of a single molecule banging around inside. Uh, notice that we do have a V squared to this. Some of that, kind of looking at this, uh, the big picture, this impulse was the change in the momentum. The momentum was M times V in the X. Uh, but it's coming back more often because it's traveling faster, so it's like a double whammy with velocity. One is the uh, first the momentum, which is coming in with a punch, and with the, the, the other velocity, it's coming in and hitting more often. And so both of those effects lead to the idea of the pressure. Okay, just a little more here. Okay, so again, this is just the average uh, force on the, with a single molecule banging around. That's the average force on that wall. Uh, the total force on the wall is really due to a whole bunch of molecules. We'll have n of them, and uh, they all could be traveling at different velocities. I'm assuming the sample of the gas is the same, so their m's are the same. The uh, d of the wall, the distance there, should be the same. So I can, should be able to take that out front, factor that out of the summation. And so I'm going to do that. And I'm also going to kick in a total n. That's the total number of molecules. So I'm just multiplying by n, dividing by n. And the reason I want to do that is what this is. This is the sum of all the squares of those velocities. They can, again, they can all be different, but we're going to sum them all up and divide by the total number of them. That's going to give us the average squared velocity. And we write that this way, v, v sub x squared, and we get the bar over that. That's the average of the squares of all these different velocities. Whew, okay. Maybe I Shouldn't have gone that way, but um, 
Now in general, this is the velocity in the x-direction. We want to be able to express this thing with just the velocity in any direction, x, y, z, or any components of those. And from that, we're just going to say the v squared is equal to the v in the x squared plus v in the y squared plus v in the z squared. Uh, if we're dealing with averages, it's still true. Just put a bar above them so that it's the average of those. And also, I expect that it should, this story should be the same in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. So these should end up being the same. I'm just playing this game against the x wall. The other walls would lead to these terms. But I really want to say that uh, v squared should be equal to 3v in the x, since these are equal or v in the x squared is one-third of this v squared. It's just one-third of all of these molecules. And so I'm going to replace that with, instead of v sub x squared, average of those, we'll take v squared, average of, of those. Now, when I, or excuse me, I did this. Now I'm going to do one other thing here. I'm going, to, I'm going to multiply by 2 and divide by 2. And the reason I want to do that, this looks strangely familiar. 1 half mv squared, or almost v squared, this is kinetic energy. So this is relating to the force on the wall, which we're leading to as the pressure, is going to be directly proportional to the average kinetic energy of these molecules. Okay, and a uh, little aside here, the average, we really average translational kinetic energy per molecule, I should say, uh, is, is going to be that. Uh, sometimes we, uh, we're asked for the VRMS. Notice, uh, to do this, we had to take all the molecules, we'd square them, then we'd end up taking the average of the squares. So we're doing the average of the squares. Now if I take this whole thing and I take the square root of it, this is what we call the VRMS. Uh, it kind of it stands for root, uh, root mean square, and actually it's probably better to think of it in reverse. First you square the velocities of all the molecules, then you take the mean or the average of those squareds, and then we'll take the square root of it. So it's sort of, think of it sort of like the average speed, but it's really the average of the squared speeds. Okay, sometimes you'll ask for that. And that one earlier problem, you asked for the VRMS speed, and it really uh, doesn't belong with liquids and gas. It belongs strictly here, really here with gases. Um, okay, so we're left here, and we've got the uh, total force on the wall. To, now we're almost there. We've got the, the total pressure. should just be the total force all over the area. Uh, we had inside a cube, so the area of that face was d squared, d on the side, uh, d squared. Um, and I already have a d up here, so if I take this total force and really divide it by d squared, the only thing that changes here goes from a d now with the d squared up to a d cubed, which is the volume of that little container. And with that volume, we can now put things together. We've got, that's V. I can move that, and this is pressure here. I'll take this over to the other side. PV is equal to this. It's going to be directly proportional to the kinetic energy of the molecule, or average kinetic energy of the, of the molecule. Um, but we also know the gas law is true. PV equals nRT. For my purposes, I want to use this other one, nKBT. Since I've got an n up here, I'd like to deal with that. So if I take this is equal to that, and this is equal to that, I can set the two equal. And I set that equal to that. Um, and uh, what I'll do is, just for convenience, I'm going to take these terms. The n's are going to cancel. I do have Boltzmann's constant, and so that's going to be 3, three halves kBT is going to be the average translational kinetic energy per molecule. So here we've got the temperature involved is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy of the molecules that are inside. 
Uh, I got a big red box around this. We got jam through this quick. This is definitely the heavy duty stuff of the whole section, kinetic theory. Uh, hopefully you can at least follow that or you have a flavor for the idea. Uh, this really sums it up well and in terms of doing problems uh, you want to be able to do something like this. Uh, uh, if you need to solve for the VRMS speed I'd start here and then go back and say oh well I'm just going to take this and take the square root of it. Uh, so if I know KB uh, I know the temperature, I know the mass of the molecules, I can come back and get the average of the squared speeds, or the RMS speeds of those molecules. Okay, uh, maybe, are you ready for a break? Yes. Okay, why don't we take a break here and then I'm, I'll, I'll come back briefly to this, really taking this, using it, and then we're going to start to start into processes. Where are we at? Okay, I think we're not too far along. I know there's a lot of stuff and I'm jamming through this fast. Let's uh, take a 10 or 15 minute break.